Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Okay, Danny, let's get started. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot, How Doers Get More Done. This week, we help a homeowner on how to brighten up the kitchen that has 40-year-old stained cabinets. Now, will she have to strip everything down? No, we've got a way to make it a lot easier and still have some great professional results. The great thing about a 40-year-old cabinet is probably very well made that it's still in use. So, yeah, you don't always have to strip it right down to the bare wood, but sometimes just a good cleaning can help quite a bit in a kitchen like that. And stucco is a very popular and durable exterior for any home, but occasionally you'll have little hairline cracks. And when that happens, what do you do to repair it? Well, we're going to talk through those steps with a homeowner living in California. And also, when you do have to paint stucco, hey, let me tell you, if you do it right and use the right paint, it will last for a long, long time, and you can really change the color up and still have a very low-maintenance exterior. Also, we want to talk with a homeowner that's got a little bit of damaged fiber cement siding commonly called hardy board and what's happened there is a a little weed eating got out of hand and scarred it up a little bit though it's a very durable siding it can get scarred very easy does that mean it has to be replaced or is there a way to successfully repair it so that it looks like new we're going to talk through that all that process to help this homeowner out If you've got a central air conditioning unit, take a close look at those thin aluminum fins on the outside of the unit. If they're bent or or crushed in any way, you need to straighten them out. Otherwise, the air conditioner is not operating as efficiently as it should. So I'm going to share a simple solution on a professional tool that you can buy, a little hand tool, very affordable, that can rake out those fins and make them straight as if they were brand new. Boy, that's so important, making sure that that not only maintain the inside air conditioning system, but also that condenser unit outside. We've got a lot to cover, so let's get started. Janice is on the line right now. Janice, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. I love this question that you have and uh, to discuss a little bit about um, updating some kitchen. Tell us all about it. My father's house is about 40 years old. It's the original house that I grew up in. Uh And um, he is replacing and taking out the carpet and going to put hardwood floors in. And I've talked him into extending it into the kitchen. And so his kitchen cabinets and everything in it is the original. Uh And they are stained, the cabinets are. And some of the cabinets look good. Some of them do not. And I'm wondering, what is my best? Uh, resolution to bring back some of those cabinets back to life. Should I restain them? How do I do it? What do I do? All righty. And, and do you have, um, when, when you're looking at the cabinets, uh, what kind of um, uh, wear and tear do you see there? Do you see areas that are uh, kind of maybe scratched a little bit back to bare wood? I see mostly water damage because the cabinets that don't look the best are the ones near the sink. Um, the ones that are away, like over the refrigerator or in the pantry area or where the broom is kept, those cabinets look pretty good. Um, there is some dirt area around the knob. Yeah, okay. Well, one of the things, first of all, cleaning, cleaning, cleaning it. And uh, we have a great little tip where you basically just take a brand new sponge and wet it and then put it in the microwave. Uh, Joe, what is that, about 20 to 30 seconds, something like that? I'm not even sure it's that long, Dan. It's like 10 to 15 seconds, maybe. Yeah, and then you so hot you can't handle it. Exactly. And you, you know, use some of the gloves, though, to, to make sure that you don't burn yourself. Then use a citrus cleaner. You know, those are really, really popular. I love the oh. way those things, things smell anyway. And then you use that with that hot, moist sponge, and you'll be surprised how it'll kind of melt off a lot of the grease and, and the buildup over the 40 years. And those areas around your knobs, it can improve. And I, I might even suggest taking the knobs off to make it easier to really thoroughly clean it. Now, at that point, right away, you're going to notice a big difference in the cabinets. You'll be amazed at how maybe that buildup is a lot more than you realize over the years with cooking and so forth. So that's the first step. After that, um, maybe take one of the doors off 
take it to your paint store, one that you have a lot of confidence in, and then try to get them to provide you a stain that will match as close as possible. And then this is where it gets a little tricky because then you're actually, you, you'll want to make sure after you know, you've know you cleaned it well, you're also going to want to lightly sand the outside of the cabinets, not to strip off all of the finish, but just to try to take off some of the gloss that you have. So probably something like a 200 grit sandpaper just to do that and then, you know, clean the dust off of it and then um, do what we call surface staining. So you're not staining everything. You're just kind of glossing over it to fill in some of the um, worn areas that you have there so that you can kind of balance it. You have to play with it a little bit, step back and look at it, and you'll see that you can slowly get all of the consistent look that you want on the outside of the cabinets, and then you'll want it to dry overnight. After that, then you'll want to put um, two coats, uh, probably semi-gloss um, polyurethane on it to really lock that color in. And you're not refinishing the whole thing. You might try some new hardware. That always makes a big difference there. So when you're at the store, you may want to take that uh, while you have the cabinet off, leave the hardware on the doors and that way you can get the exact type of offset so that you're not uh, so that the footprint of the hinge goes right back over what's there you might you'll be amazed at how much better it'll look by just going through these few short steps oh thank you ever so much i appreciate it it's exactly what i was looking for um to help him out and and understand um, in in the notes that I have here from the producer, uh, your father's uh, eighty seven years young. I understand. Yes, he is, and so we're just. I've moved back to Mississippi, and so we're just working on a couple of projects. I'm painting with him tomorrow, and I'm going to throw this one out at him since it's so easy, and um, we'll we'll do this project together. I really appreciate it. Ah, oh, that sounds so great, and hope you have a great weekend, and I know the project will turn out great, and the most rewarding thing you'll have is when you see that smile on his face. Thank you. Have a great day. Okay, you as well. Thank you. Hey, Joe, one of the things that um, you, you mentioned to me earlier in the week that I wanted to make sure we uh, touched on, um, a couple weeks ago we talked about the M1 additive that that I'm a big fan of, which is a mildicide that you can put in paint. Right. And I, I painted the outside of my existing house as well as my house I'm, I'm about to sell. And it's amazing how it kept any of the mildew down because it's su such a problem in it coming out in paint. Of course, I did the paint job the right way, good brand of paint and so forth. But a question about one of our listeners is, can you use that when you're using stain? I understand you found out the answer on that. Yeah, I contacted the manufacturer, Sunnyside is the name of the manufacturer, and I'll read you exactly what they sent me. And it says, M1 Advanced Mildew Treatment. That's what it's called. It comes in a little plastic bottle. You can just pour it right into a gallon of paint. And it says it resists mold, mildew, algae, on dry film, meaning paint, dry paint film, for, and it's for use on all interior and exterior latex-based products, oil and solvent-based pro products, including paints, stains. That was the question, could you put this in a wood stain? And yes, you can. Paints, stains, coatings, I'm not sure what that is, and adhesives. So hmm. sounds like you can use this M1 mildew treatment in, in stains and paints. Let's go right to the lines right now, Joe, and see if we can help out Richard in California. Richard, welcome to the Today's Homeowner Radio Show. Hello. Good to talk with you. Absolutely. Tell us about this. Um, stucco is a great finish for the outside of the house, but every now and then I have a few cracks. I guess that's what you're experiencing now, huh? Right. Uh, I think I mentioned the house was built in the, in the 60s. It's an older house. And, um, yeah, I have these vertical cracks uh, and, and it seems mostly on my south side and east side. That gets the most sun. So I guess over the years, it's kind of beat on it. It seems like the other sides are okay. But I have some, you know, I don't want to say they're major cracks. I, I think they're superficial. And some of them seem to run in line with the studs that might be, uh, that, that are in the wall. Well, Richard, um I can. You sent us a photograph, and thank you for that, because it would be hard to see. There are cracks, and there are really bad cracks. Fortunately, you have what are hairline cracks, and there's a few different ways to typically repair cracks in stucco, um, and I'm not sure you're going to need to do this, but I'll just explain it. Um, often... 
the cracks are wider than you what I appears that you have on your walls, and you'd scratch it out with sometimes just a pointed. A uh, can opener, like a beer can opener, the old type of beer can openers, or uh-huh. any kind of tool like you'd scrape it out, widen it a little bit, make it V-shaped, and fill it with some kind of stucco repair product. But in this case, um, I'm not sure you would even need to do that. These are so such tightly um, together, the cracks themselves. If you, but if you want to try it, I would scratch it out. And there's a there are several different stucco repair products. <clears throat> the one that I've used from Quickcrete is simply called Stucco Repair Sealant, and it comes in a caulking tube. So you just need a caulking gun. What you do is you you squeeze it into the crack. It's weather resistant and it's also textured to blend in with the existing um, surfaces. Uh, and and, it, and you can once it's dry, you can paint over. It's only about eight bucks a tube. Um, but yours are so small, I'm not sure if I wouldn't just try uh, a really good stucco paint over it. And if it continues to crack, then you can try repairing it. Because um, there's not much, you can't stop it from cracking, if that was part of your question. Right. You know, if it's going to crack, it's going to crack. It's just about, and the good thing about using a, a repair sealant as opposed to like more stucco is that it's flexible. You know, so it'll expand and contract and hopefully not show these cracks um, you know, again, and you know, the then the reason you want to seal up these cracks, of course, you want water getting in there because then the stuck will start coming off. But again, these are such tight cracks, just barely hairline. Um, I think I'd keep an eye on them for a while and then f- fill them in if you see them get a little wider or if they start chipping off. Right now, um, I, I just to kind of add on there now, they they do make some some paints now that are very elastic. Right, elastomeric not? paints. Okay. And are those are those pretty effective for something yes. like this? Yes. Yeah, you have to clean the surface, prep it like any other painted surface. But yes, those are very. Make sure it's it's rated for a masonry surface, and that that would seal up those small cracks. And one of the things when you're sealing those cracks, you definitely don't want to put too much caulk in there to have it overlap uh, because that will show up even more than the crack there. But I'll tell you what, if you paint a stucco house right with the right materials, it will last for a long, long time. Great way to approach that. Richard, thanks so much for being with us. Let's go right to our emails here. We've got a lot of great emails, and thank you for sending those. And you can send one right now by going to todayshomeowner.com slash ask. Mary in Newport, Florida has a little problem here. It says, hi, Danny and Joe. The drain line from my central air conditioner is clogged up. How is the best way to unclog it and prevent it from clogging again? Okay, Mary, I'll tell you. You can take care of this. And have a little fun along the way. It sounds a little funny, but I'm telling you, I've used this trick a number of times. Joe, uh, I'll let you have the opportunity there to, to to share that very, very simple solution to this problem. You're talking about the, the wet-dry vacuum? Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah okay, that's exactly that's right. fun. <laughs> Danny likes his wet dry vacuum, as you can tell. Um, yeah, you can. I'm, I'm assuming that this drain line is outside and available for you to get to. Usually it is. It doesn't always, you know, sometimes it goes into a floor drain, but typically it's outside and just drips outside. Hook up your shop vac and just suck out whatever's in there. You'd be surprised and maybe a little scared. Um, I would take the filter out just in case it's a wet, the filter out of the vacuum in case it's a, a really wet soggy mess that's in there and then treat it with um bleach or they do make something called um tablets pan tablets which i'm not really sure what they're made of maybe danny knows what they're like they look like alka seltzer a little bigger and you put them in the overflow pan and they help keep the drain line clear now if the shop vac does not work they do make there's a company called recto seal r-e-c-t-o-r seal rector rector seal they make two different manual pumps one's a foot pump and one looks like a bicycle pump and they provide a lot of pressure and you can hook those up and they'll up by the air handler and just force out it forces air in and that will blow out any clog as well and if you want to see that um, exact trick, you can go to todayshomeowner.com and in a little search engine there, put in um, unclogging an AC drain line, and it'll show you exactly how to put the shop back on it, how to put the little rag around it or tape it off. And uh, it only takes about, about five seconds, and it's all nice and clean. You'll be amazed at what comes out of a pipe like that. And you need to do that on a regular basis, especially putting the cup of bleach in that drain to keep keep it nice and clean.
time for our best new product segment brought to you by the Home Depot. How doers get more done. If you have pets, you know how hard it is to find a vacuum for your needs and so does Dyson because they developed a vacuum just for you. The Dyson V8 Animal Cord Free Vacuum. It's engineered for homes with furry family friends so you won't have any problems getting up all of that pet hair or that scattered litter and getting it all under control. The battery is designed to deliver up to 40 minutes of fade-free suction and the direct drive cleaner head in this model gets 150% more brush bar power from the motor than the V6 cord-free vacuum. And with the whole machine HEPA filtration, it captures pet allergens and expels cleaner air as well. Plus, it's cordless, so it's easy to use anywhere, and it transforms for easy cleaning up high and into handheld for quick cleans really close at hand. So for more information on the Dyson V8 Animal Cord-Free Vacuum, go to home HomeDepot.com. Well, I tell you, I got a um, a text the other day from a a friend of mine who's a lawyer up in uh, Washington D.C. And what he's done is, of course, he's easing back into his practice and moving things along. But what he's doing is for, he's he's working in the mornings in his office, right. and in the afternoon he is working. He, he and his teenage son have a project building a shed in their backyard. And they have these very elaborate uh, plans that he sent right. everything out to me and all to look at. And um, one of his questions was, how do I cut in a hip rafter? And I right. went, whoa. <laughs> whoa. Yeah. He's Boy, getting the, you. <laughs> the most, one of the more complicated roof framing yeah. um, designs and, right there. Yeah. And how do you answer that in a text? You know, yeah, uh, right. <laughs> you know I, I said, well, you might want to consider a gable roof. And, and of course, so many <laughs> times when you have plans like that, it's overkill. I mean, like they had, yeah. they had a triple rafter uh, to support the ridge on each end. The ridge is only like four and a half feet long. And they had a oh, triple rafter wow. on each end. I go, well, you know, are you like hanging a, a an engine from the inside of this? Right. He, goes, he goes, no, but we wanted it a vaulted ceiling and things like that. So I was able to um, give him a little bit of advice and everything. But I thought that's so cool for him to dedicate that time and that project. That's something, uh, look at what you're providing, what he's providing that son of his in right taking a project from start to finish, learning how to do all of these things piece by piece, and then working side by side. Uh, I just think those kind of stories are fantastic. Yeah, and what he really taught his son is, next time you build a shed, do a gable roof. Yeah, do a gable hip roof. <laughs> those hip roofs <laughs> can be a real pain. I know. I, I asked him, I said, send me a, send me some uh, uh, some pictures uh, over the next few days, so it'll be interesting yeah. to zoom yeah. in on some of those pictures yeah. and see what kind of gaps we got here and there. Right. So. <laughs> well, I've, ri- I've written three shed building books, and in each book, we built, I think, five or six sheds, and I only built one hip roof. Uh-huh. Because, yeah. you know, first of all, I'm not a particular fan of hip roofs. I much right. prefer to see siding than roofing. Yeah. And uh-huh. with hip roof, you see a lot of shingles, and I'd rather That's see right. siding. And plus, of course, you lose a lot of headroom in the building itself, including if it's a shed. But, um, yeah, some people still like hip roofs, and I, I, I guess I can kind of understand that. Right now, we're going to go right to the hotline new in New Hampshire. Hillary's on the line. Hillary, welcome to the show. Hi. Tell us about this. You've got a little bit of a, boy, I tell you, rotten wood is just everywhere, and it's hard to get ahead of it sometimes. Tell us uh, tell us about it. You sent some great pictures. It's like a basement window. Yes, it is a basement window, and it's facing north, and I, I suspect that's the reason we've had the difficulty we've had. Um, and I have repaired other windows, the exact same windows, with wood filler and kept them up well, but for some reason, this one just doesn't seem to remain fixed. So what I would like to know is how you think I should fix it, because it's such a small job, I can't get anyone out to do it, and I would love to make it fixed for once and for all. Okay. All right. I can understand that frustration because it is aggravating when you have, you know, just always something around like that that has to be done. Well, here's the way I would approach it. I would first, uh, I would take a, a razor knife and a flat bar, a crowbar that's a flat bar and a hammer. And then I would just score around the different pieces of wood that are damaged and then slowly remove each one of them, just disassembling each piece because all of it's not going to be bad, but get all of the pieces that are bad. And then you'll know exactly the, the, the dimension of material that you need to replace it. Now, um, nowadays we're so fortunate that you don't have to use 
wood anymore. You can use um, cellular PVC, composite material. There's a lot of stuff out there right in uh, the aisles of Home Depot that you can go and uh, match this and put something in there that you'll never have to use, uh, never have to replace again. Now, certainly it's still important once you reassemble the pieces. And, and I, I suspect, Hillary, with what we're looking at here on the pictures, that uh, you're going to have to do some cutting. And if you're not cuff comfortable with cutting these pieces of wood, you will have to get someone to help you. Uh, but you can put these pieces in, nail it, glue it, caulk it, repaint it, make sure it's sealed up nice and tight, and you're done. You won't have to replace any of those pieces of wood um, again. Now, if you do want someone to do this, a couple tips for you there is one, to call the local Home Builders Association. They have chapters all over the country. And and, and, and tell the person that you talk to on the phone, say, I've got a small job. Do you have someone that's a handyman that specializes in small projects? They probably have a list that can share with you. And another tip there is if you know any realtors in your area that are routinely selling residential homes all the time, they all always have a few names of guys that do the little small projects that they need to have done in order to get a house closed. So a couple different ways to go about that. Okay. Well, I have a question regarding what you just told me. Okay. Should I remove the whole piece on the bottom and then replace it with something that is not wood? Or are you suggesting that I can combine a synthetic material with the wood? Oh, you can certainly combine it, yeah. Yeah, that that is a really good question. Yeah, you don't have to. Any of it that's still good, you don't have to replace it. The more you replace, the better, just because, you know, you don't want to have uh, the opportunity for it to, um, you know, have any wood rot in the future. But you certainly can combine those, and they'll you'll never know what's wood and what's not wood when you get it all together, caulked and painted. A very, very easy way to go about that. Okay, so if I can't find someone to help me, what do I use to cut the wood? Because actually what you're saying to me is what I was thinking that I should do, but since I'm a complete novice, <laughs> I was afraid to do it. Sure. So is there a special tool that I can buy that would give me a cut like that, that I need to just cut that damaged part out? Okay. Um, well, a lot of times uh, when you're doing uh, demolition work like that and removing, disassembling things, um, it's very common to use a reciprocating saw. It's a pretty aggressive saw uh, for a novice to use, but that can be done. I think you will do just fine using the flat bar, the hammer, okay. and maybe a chisel in order to chisel some of it out. Okay. And another thing, you might take this piece of wood and measure it just right. Sometimes in some home depots, they will actually cut that exact piece of wood for you so that you're walking out of there with a pre-cut piece of wood to slip right in place. Actually, they have actually done that for me, so you are correct. Yeah, there you go. So that would be a perfect way of doing it. I admire your tenacity to tackle this and uh, and to be able to get it behind you. It'll be easier than you might think because it's just common sense and removing these pieces, holding on to what you need to replace, and then going to the store and getting that exact piece. So I think you'll be in great shape. You can use some construction adhesive. Always works a little bit to bed these pieces in uh, place. And then a few nails here and there, and, and you're ready to paint. Thank you. You've given me a bit more confidence. <laughs> good, good. Well, if you run into anything at all, we're here to help you anytime. Just let us know. And I hope you have a, a successful project and certainly a great weekend. Thank you. Love the show. Okay. Thank you very much, Hillary. Appreciate that. You know, one of the things that uh, we get a lot of emails and a lot of phone calls about is how much people love our Simple Solution segment. And, and I understand why, because it's so cool when you have these, you know, certain problems or challenges, uh, simple things around the house that drive you crazy, and then suddenly you find a solution to that problem, and uh, then you, you'll you never forget that and share it with others. We really love to do that. That's why we love for Joe Truini each week to share with us another Simple Solution. Okay, Danny, this one has to do with when you need to drill a hole into a drywall ceiling or a plaster ceiling, even small holes creates quite a surprising amount of dust. So here's how to make that task a little neater. First, drill through the bottom, the center bottom of a small paper cup or a styrofoam cup. Then all you need to do is hold the cup tight against the ceiling, drill the hole, and then 
all the dust will fall. If you hold it tight against the ceiling, all that dust will fall into the cup. And then just dump the, you know, if you need to drill another hole, make sure you dump the the dust out and go and drill the next hole. You'd be surprised. I did this recently. And, um, you know, I mean, the only other option is to have the dust fall all over you, then vacuum it or try to hold the vacuum up at the same time against the ceiling. And if you have somebody else, I guess that would work, catch most of the dust. But this is much easier and quieter, and um, it works every single time. And I think Dennis might want to add something, or our engineer might want to add something to this tip. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, uh, you know, I've come to the conclusion that Joe Truini is the MacGyver of home improvement. The MacGyver, <laughs> I like that. Yeah, yeah. All yeah. Right, I'll take that. He can pick up just about anything uh, beyond the traditional duct tape and um, WD-40 and go well beyond that with some of his uh, simple solutions. That's uh, This that's, is the guy you want to be trapped with. That's what right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Can you say that louder? My wife missed that little that part of the show. She's probably trapped somewhere. <laughs> yeah. There are so well, thank you, Dennis. So many simple solutions that you can uh, check out. I mean, why not uh, check out a few of the 500 that are waiting on you right now at todayshomeowner.com slash simple solutions. There's certainly some great ones there that will uh, solve a lot of those issues around there. And, yes, using some things that you probably have sitting at your house or in the pantry or in your toolbox. Uh, so it's not something that's going to cost you a lot of money, but can certainly uh, make life a little more relaxing. And now it's time for our podcast question of the week that comes from South Carolina. Moses asks, I have a block wall in the backyard that is breaking down from the pressure of dirt from my neighbor. Their house sits a little higher than mine, about the height of the wall. What would be the best way to fix it or reinforce it? Can I just build another wall in front of it? Oh, that's a good one, isn't it, Joe? I'll tell you that. Yeah. The the pressure that you have, especially if you're talking about a, a you know a wall that's fairly high, Boy, if it's not built properly and you've got so much pressure behind it, you have water, that's hydrostatic pressure pushing on it. There's a lot going on there that uh, does require it to be built right the first time. But what do you think about actually constructing a wall in front of it? Because so often when you build a wall, you have to tie back into the ground right. with little little fingers going back in there to support. It doesn't have to be done um, in some cases, but I think an engineer getting involved here to advise um, Moses on this probably would be a good good money spent. Yeah, I think so, because first of all, you could build a wall in front of it, if that's the question. Yeah, you could build a wall in front of it, but what prevents the existing block wall from breaking down and hitting your wall and then having the same problem like dominoes. So, and, and it's not really clear whether this wall is the neighbor's wall, in which case maybe he can't do anything about it. Um, but if you wanted to repair that particular wall and he had access to it, what you ordinarily do is dig out the dirt from behind it, um, repair the wall as necessary, then backfill, but not with more dirt, but with put in a drainage pipe, put in gravel, landscaping fabric, do anything you can to keep the soil from, and the wet soil in particular, from pushing against the back of that wall, and then, you know, add the soil as necessary. Um, but th that's about the only thing you can do. I would not recommend just building another wall in front of it because, as I said, you know, the, the old wall will, will, might collapse up against the new wall. Exactly. Yeah. Get that structural engineer out that routinely does work on residential uh, projects. He, he's dealt with that exact same issue before, and that's the way that you can be for sure never to have to do it again by following um, all of his recommendations. Hey, this is our podcast question of the week. You can have your question answered here on the Today's Homeowner podcast by simply sending it in at any time. Todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Thank you so much for the continued wonderful reviews. We've gotten more people downloading the Today's Homeowner podcast now than ever before, and we certainly appreciate each and every one of you listening to us each week. And we're going to have a few extra podcasts that we'll be throwing in from time to time on some real important subjects um, as we move through this year. But I'm Danny Lipford along with my buddy Joe Truini. Thank you so much for listening to this Today's Homeowner podcast.